Well, let's turn in our Bibles to the opening three verses of Hebrews. They're going to be our focus this evening, and there is so much in them. We're thinking this evening of Jesus, the full and final word. We live in a world that's always looking for something extra. It's as if we have a a built-in antenna for a message from outside us. Whether it's people seeking for a message from extraterrestrials, or from angels, or from divine beings, we have this antenna. We're not just tuned in to earthly frequencies. There's something in us that was made to listen to for something greater. Some want to know the secret that will unlock everything. Head into your local bookshop and you will find copies of numerous books telling you the secret. Or for others it might be getting in sync with some Mayan calendar. Or opening yourself up to spirit guides. Or it might be a Muslim friend. Uh, saying that you need to hear from a prophet, the prophet who came after Jesus, Allah's messenger, Muhammad. Or it might be someone coming back from Medjugorje, and they have had revelations given to them there, and they want you to know these things. Or it may be the Mormons knocking at your door and saying, you need to hear what our prophet, Joseph Smith, said. He's the the last and the, the final prophet. Or it might be the latest televangelist huckster saying, God has given me a message for you. And if you put $200 in my PayPal account, I will give it to you. I'll share the message. There's always something extra that people are looking for. Uh, But that built-in antenna, instead of perpetually scanning the frequencies, is meant to lock in to the one great communication from our Creator and to stay locked on it. And the readers of this letter, the hearers of it, these people named Hebrews, were looking for something extra. They were looking for something with a little bit more punch than what they were getting each week. They hearkened back to the majestic old days when there were prophets, when there were men of boldness, and men of vigour who brought a word direct from God. And they were going to go back to that day and that message. And in three magnificent verses, our author sets out that Jesus is God's full and final communication. And that we are to lock our antenna onto him. And we are to listen to him and to him only. There's two main things for us to see this evening. Jesus is the full and final word. He is the full and final word. And then we're going to see that he is the most glorious messenger. He is the full and final word and he is the most glorious messenger. God is a speaking God. As we're thinking, first of all, is Jesus the full and final word? God is a speaking God. He created the world by speaking. That's very different to the other creation myths where there were wars between gods and worlds coming out of blood and the bowels of defeated gods and goddesses. There was something radical and different in the Genesis account. God spoke it into being. Nothing else had existed, but God spoke. And he was a God who talked with his creation. He spoke with Adam. But man departed from God's voice. And yet our author says, in the past, God spoke. Let that sink in for a moment. There's a kindness to that. He could have left us to stew, but he spoke into the mess. He sent his word into the mess. Spoke words of instruction, words of promise, words of life, words of correction, words of rebuke, and words of hope. He sent his word into the mess. I hold that thought in your mind. That would be a pattern for what would come. He spoke repeatedly many times and over a long period in the past and in many ways. More and more kindness. And we'll mention some of those ways in a moment. But you see, all of those ways were fragmentary. And they were spread out over many ways and at many times. The word was perfect, but it was 
thinly spread. There was no one place to look to and say, yes, this is it. This here sums up God. You need to pull it all together. But after many ages had passed, all that changed. We read that in these last days, And I think the author is using that phrase in a significant way, not just saying recently, but in this final era of history, something new has happened. Well, what was it? Well, God, we read, spoke by his Son. By his Son. Still the same God who speaks. There's nothing that contradicts what he had said before. But the writer wants his hearers, his readers, and us to see that what we have now isn't thin and fragmentary, but is full and rich and final. It's a bit like in the really old days, days that I don't even remember, but I see it in films where there were telegraphs and telegrams and messages to be sent. Struck iceberg, stop. Ship sinking, quickly, stop. Send life boats, send help, stop. Uh, terse and brief and compare that with the live broadcast in high definition colour why would you go back to the days of the telegram or like a boy receiving telegram communications from his girlfriend and the girlfriend arrives at his home and he says "Could, could you go away I want to go back to just telegrams please that's what was happening here God has spoken in his son And the writer wants us to see the fullness and the finality. And he does so by really a series of contrasts. The Son is better in three ways. His revelation, first of all, is full, not fragmented. Full, not fragmented. In the past, it was many times and in various ways. In a sense, God spoke slowly. He gave it piece by piece. Jigsaw pieces, one piece with sacrifice on it, one piece with the tabernacle on it, one piece with servant on it, one piece with prophet and priest and king on them. And as time went on, the jigsaw of God's revelation about himself was growing towards completion. But now we don't have a selection of jigsaw pieces to put together to know what God is like. He's appeared among us. In his Son. Here is the Word made flesh, as John would put it. Here is the message in full, concentrated, unfragmented form. And I want us to see how full this is. It was as if it had taken all of those men in the Old Testament over all those centuries to say was now compressed and distilled and poured into the Son, or rather out through the Son. To us, God was communicating in the Son to us. He is the full expression of what God has to say. He is the prophet, the priest, the king, the servant, the sacrifice, the temple, the dwelling of God among men. He's the last Adam that we read of, the first one in Genesis. He's the Lamb of God and the tabernacle and the rescue and the Passover Lamb from Exodus. He's the sacrifices and feasts of Leviticus. He's the star that would come from Jacob, the scepter that would arise from Israel. That jigsaw piece is in numbers. In Deuteronomy, he's the lawgiver and the law keeper and the final prophet. He's the captain of our salvation who leads us into the promised land from the book of Joshua. He's the mighty one bound whose binding brings about our salvation. And judges from Ruth. He's the kinsman redeemer who shelters the outcast. He's the defeater of our giant enemies from 1 Samuel. He's the good shepherd king of 2 Samuel. He's the wise, peace-bringing king from 1 Kings. He's the merciful, miracle-working Elisha, whose name means the salvation of God from 2 Kings. He's the son who always sits on the throne of David. And he's the temple of the Lord in all its magnificence. The place where God meets with man of First and Second Chronicles. He's the bringer back from exile of Ezra. He's the repairer of God's city and the wall around God's people of Nehemiah. 
He's the one who intercedes on behalf of his people from Esther. He's the Redeemer that Job saw, who would stand upon the earth and give life back to his people. He's the sum and substance and singer of every one of the 150 Psalms. He's the living embodiment of the wisdom of the book of Proverbs. He's the answer to all Ecclesiastes questions. He's the altogether lovely husband of Song of Solomon. He's the virgin son and the pierced prince of peace and the crushed servant of Isaiah. Jeremiah's jigsaw pieces include the righteous branch, the wise king, the Lord our righteous saviour. Lamentations by Jeremiah. We see a glimpse of our saviour as the people of God under the judgment of God. He's the good shepherd in the new temple and the river of life from Ezekiel. He's the fourth one. The one who looked like the Son of God in the furnace with his people in Daniel. He's a stone that became a mountain from Daniel. He's the forsaken husband who rescues and redeems his fickle, faithless bride in Hosea. He's the one who pours out his spirit on his people from Joel. He's the fearsome judge who punishes the nations of Amos. He is the defeater of the persecutors of his people from Obadiah. He's the one who was dead and has risen from the grave from Jonah. He's the one whose origins were from of old, but who was born in Bethlehem from the book of Micah. He's the warrior of Nahum. He's the reason why Habakkuk in his despair could still rejoice. He is the coming day of the Lord in Zephaniah. He's the one who said, I will build my church in the book of Haggai. He's the one who clothes his people in righteous white purity against all the accusations of Satan in Zechariah. He's the son of righteousness who is healing for his people, preceded by that great Elijah preaching in the wilderness, make smooth, make plain the way for the Lord. We read of in Malachi. 1,500 years, 30 different authors, 39 books, all fragments funneled down into one person. That's what I mean by fool. That's what I mean by rich. We are not the poorer for reducing to the sun. It took 1,500 years and many times and many ways to capture a fraction of what the sun would reveal to us. Full, not fragmented. Secondly, final and not gradual. We'll be a bit briefer in these second two points here. Final and not gradual, not incomplete. It doesn't need added to. God has spoken, we're told. In these last days, he has spoken. He has spoken, past tense. It's indicated that in the Son, God has had the final word. For many years, God spoke in gradual form, building up the picture. But now, as it were, at the end of history, he has spoken in his Son, completely and compellingly. Why go back to the gradual and the incomplete? And you've got the final edition here. Maybe like me, you've been in a meeting and uh, you're working at, off a document and you realise that some people in the room haven't got the latest edition and they're struggling to keep up. Well, why would we go back to previous editions, as it were, when we've got the full and final word in the Son? That doesn't mean that we don't read the Old Testament, of course. We read the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus Christ and see it in all its richness, but... We don't look for other things. other. We don't tune our antenna for other signals. We've got it all here. Wonderfully. And this finality has this implication. Nothing more is to be looked for. Nothing more is to be added. Not by Muhammad. Not by Joseph Smith. Not by any visionaries or mystics or prophets. Not by any papal infallibility. Or not by any... Uh, prophet even within the evangelical camp saying I have received a word from the Lord there are no holy words that we hold in addition to the word of God that is 
been revealed to us finally and fully through the Son. Jesus is the full and final word. And then the third contrast is between Son and servants. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. What a contrast. They were great men, but they were frail men. And although they conveyed the message flawlessly, they themselves were flawed. However, in these past days, someone new appeared on the scene. Not a servant, but a son. The flawless son. They were servants. He is the son. And he comes from the very presence of God. And he is God. And he brings the message of God. In the Son, God speaks more directly, more clearly, more richly, and more personally. And the phrase used here is lovely. English doesn't really capture it. English does its best when it says, by the Son. But the Greek is, in these last days, he has spoken in Son. It wasn't just that God spoke words by the Son. Everything about the Son, in the Son, his whole being, his manner, his attitude, his character, his tone, his gesture, everything God was speaking. Everything you read about him is God speaking in Son. That's why John says the Word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. And if we listen to the servants, how much more should we listen to the Son? These people weren't sure about the gospel message and were thinking about going back. What a poor swap it would have been. And oh, how we should value the word of God that comes to us and is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. To add to it, to to go to something, to, to swap it for visionaries or visions or additions or prophets is a poor exchange. Jesus is the full and final message. So, Jesus Christ, the full and final word. And secondly, in these verses, we look at the person of Jesus and see that Jesus is the most glorious of messengers. I suppose these people felt the pressure. Uh, Their messenger was a crucified carpenter from Nazareth. Tom Holland writes in his book Dominion, a man who had been, who'd been crucified might, that a man who had himself been crucified might be hailed as a god could not help but be seen by people everywhere across the Roman world as scandalous, obscene, grotesque. The ultimate offensiveness, though, was to one particular people, Jesus' own, the Jews. That's Hebrews. No more shocking a reversal of their most devoutly held assumptions could possibly have been imagined. Not merely blasphemy, it was madness. And so our writer, knowing that that's how it's perceived, sets out to paint a portrait of Jesus, the most glorious messenger. And he does it in English in 55 words. 55 words. Not one portrait, actually, but seven. It's a little miniature art gallery. And I want you this week to walk around the art gallery, to meditate in front of each painting. And I'm going to take you on a whirlwind tour now. First of all, we're told he's the heir of all things, whom he appointed heir of all things. He's the son, the only son. Therefore, he is the sole heir. The prophets weren't heirs. The son gets everything. We might wonder, what does that mean since God cannot die? But the Father gives everything to the Son as a gift for his great work of salvation. He's redeemed the universe and he has given it as a reward. As it reverberates with delight in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is given to him all of it. Here's the future glory of the Son. Why follow him? He's the heir of everything. He's the second portrait, the word of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God said, well, what did he say? Let there be light. 
but John puts it this way, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word simply wasn't words. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Through Him all things were made. The Word that spoke the universe into being was the Word that made flesh, that was Jesus of Nazareth. You're offended at a carpenter, our writer is saying. Oh, he was creative, all right. Much more than you ever knew. The, this portrait has carpenter's hands, but on his workbench is the Milky Way. What a portrait. Third portrait. He is the radiance of God's glory. The sun is the radiance of God's glory. Ah, but the readers might say, you know, God appeared in the Old Testament in glory, in a burning bush to Moses, in fire and smoke on Sinai, a pillar of fire by day and a cloud by night in the wilderness, a cloud of glory that filled the temple and rose above it, the Shekinah glory they would talk about. Yes, indeed. But our writer says, the sun is the radiance. He's the Shekinah glory. Yes, Moses saw the trailing edge of the back of the glory of God. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. Oh, that great prophet Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up and the, the glorious robe that he wore filled the temple and Isaiah spoke of what he saw. But Jesus was what Isaiah saw. Yes, Daniel spoke of seeing the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. But Jesus is the Son of Man. How we should pray with Moses. Show me your glory. And then look at Jesus to see the glory of God. He is the radiance of God's glory. The glory of God is, is revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. Our fourth portrait is this little phrase, the imprint, or the exact representation of his being. The imprint of his character. That's what Jesus is. He's the imprint of the character of God, pressed as it were into the flesh. The word that's used here, actually, is the Greek word that has come into English, character. It referred to a metal tool that had the, the likeness of the emperor engraved on it was pressed into soft metal to create coins and it gave an exact likeness of the original. Well, the Son is the exact likeness of the Father. That's why the Son would say, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. All the other imprints, the prophets, the forefathers weren't exact. There was a flaw in the material. Even though they were made in the image of God, they weren't the exact representation of his being, but the Son was and is. You know, sometimes people love what they read of Jesus, but they're fearful of God the Father. I think church culture here has taught people to see the Father as standing with a big stick. But Jesus says to us, If you like me, you'll love my Father. He's exactly like I am. If you've seen me, you've seen my Father. Every facet of Jesus' person is a window into the heart of God. Now that's a portrait. That's a portrait. And then we're told that this Jesus, this Jesus of Nazareth, the Son, is the sustainer of everything, sustaining all things by his powerful word. That's what he's doing now. The universe isn't just ticking over. Not according to this. God the Son is holding it all together by his powerful word. The way the, the Greek phrases it is actually by the word of his power. The focus is on his power. His power is absolute and his power uses a word. A word to uphold the universe. I've been listening to Stephen Fry narrating his audio book uh, heroes, in which he speaks of the, the, the mythology of Greece and the, the heroes of Greece. And one of them is the story of Atlas carrying the skies, straining every muscle. And then Hercules, or Heracles, as he was known to the Greeks, 
was the strongest mortal and he took over for a time and was just about able to perform the task. I was listening to that this week and here's this verse. The sun upholds the entire universe, not just the skies, by a word. A word. Every, at every moment, the glue that holds the universe together and directs all its affairs is the word of the sun. Let me speak to you this evening. If you aren't a Christian, if you aren't trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, the only reason that you're alive is his sustaining word. Think about that for a moment. You live solely by the power of the one that you reject and deny. How thin a thread your existence hangs by. What patient mercy the Son has with you. Don't test his patience and don't, don't stretch his mercy, but come to him and find that fuller mercy that is found at the cross and put your trust in him there. And then the next portrait, you see, it leads on from that. The provider of forgiveness. After he had provided purification for sins, we read. Here's the thing that the readers were ashamed of. Christ's death on the cross. But what was it? It was the fullness of every sacrifice that had ever been offered in the Old Testament. All the different kinds of sacrifices. And the day of atonement. It was all gathered together in one heap as it were and, and Christ summed it all up. A sacrifice so valuable and final that it would provide cleansing, complete cleansing for all your sins and all my sins and all the sins of his people forever and ever. And that great cry of it is finished echoes down through the millennia into your heart and mine. He is the provider of forgiveness. That's who he is. He's the sustainer of the universe. That's who he is. And our last portrait here, he is the seated and majestic king. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. His work is done, so he sits. We'll come back to that theme later on in this letter. Yes, he was humiliated on earth. But now he is enthroned in heaven. And that's who these people are following, the enthroned one. Don't see him wearing the crown of thorns. See him wearing many crowns, seated on the throne. He's the reigning, risen king. That's who the Son is. The most glorious of messengers, far outstripping anybody in the Old Testament, anybody in history, whether it's Muhammad or whether it's Joseph Smith of the Mormons, whoever it is, here is the Son of God, greater than anyone. Here is the messenger, and he's the most glorious one. Will we follow him? I want to close with one big application. And that one big application is this, that we go away from this, well, actually, we don't go away from it. We stay with it. And we read it. And we say one thing. Show me your glory. Here is the glory of your Saviour. Have you forgotten how great he is? If we could see more of who he is, how glorious he is, we wouldn't turn from him when we're under pressure or under threat or under disappointment or under temptation. We would see that Jesus is enough, that he is worth it. When we are called to put Christ first above everything else, we can see that he deserves to be first, that he's better, greater, more glorious than everything else. You see, to cope in trials, we need to be able to see that he upholds everything by the word of his power. To cope with temptation, we need to see him seated on that throne, giving grace to all who come. To cope with disappointed aspirations and hopes and dreams. We need to see him as the heir 
of all things and that what comes will far outweigh what you have dreamt of. For Paul puts it in Romans 8 that we are heirs together with him. What an astonishing thought. So will you pray, show me your glory. Show me more of my Saviour. Will you pray it as you come to church each Sunday? We can stumble over the ordinariness of the church service and the ordinariness of the preachers. But what is actually happening is wonderful. We come to church to hear and to see Jesus. That's our prayer. Show me your glory each Sunday. Let me hear this Son speak to me. And will you pray, show me your glory when you read God's word. If everything in the Old Testament points to the Son, and everything about the Son shows your Father, how hungrily we should read all of God's word. How eagerly we should look at the Son to see our Father. It is all we need. We don't need to go tuning our antenna for additional words or higher revelation. Higher? Really? It can't get any higher than this. So let's see past the ordinariness of black and white, the ink on the page, the pixels on our digital Bibles. Let's see past the, the ordinariness of the flesh and blood of the Son. And let's see this most glorious messenger who brings the most glorious message. For as we read the Word, we meet the living Word. And in knowing the living Word, we know the One of whom He is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His character. Show me your glory. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we consider these words and we marvel at the full and final message that is encapsulated in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we see who he really is, Lord, we have really bad eyesight. And we have poor vision. Forgive us for Letting the antenna of our minds want to tune in to all sorts of other messages. And Lord God, help us to see more clearly these portraits encapsulated in 55 words. Help us to see our Saviour in all his glory. Lord, we, it'll take all eternity to do that, but we want to see more now. We want to see more now so that we can be amazed at our Saviour. We can see the one who is our Redeemer. Help us as we read our Bibles to see those jigsaw pieces in the Old Testament all coming together and finding their fulfilment in Jesus. Help us as we look at the Son to see in Him everything that is gloriously beautiful in Him is Him revealing you to us as well. And Lord God, we pray that as we contemplate the Son, that we will be better equipped to live for him here and that we would be transformed into his image more and more. We ask it for Jesus' sake and for Jesus' glory. Amen.